So our first step will be setting up our environment for learning Windows Server. We're going to be setting it up on a virtual machine. A virtual machine is a separate operating system that runs independently but side by side with your host operating system. It uses your computer's hardware, but any changes made within a virtual machine will not affect your host operating system. To do this, we're going to use a software called VMware Workstation. Now, there is a paid version of VMware Workstation, but we're going to be using the free trial in order to set this up. There are other software packages out there that allow you to do the same thing, like VirtualBox, but we're going to be using VMware Workstation. You can access VMware Workstation by going to VMware.com, Products, Workstation. We're going to select Try for Free, and I'm running Windows 64-bit, and so I'm going to hit Download. Once the download is complete, we'll open up the installer. and we'll simply follow the prompts. The defaults should be fine for most installations. Once the installation is finished, we'll click Finish, and we'll open up VMware Workstation. Before we create our virtual machine and install Windows Server, we need to obtain the installation media for Windows Server 2012. Normally when you install Windows or Windows Server, you can use a bootable CD, DVD, or USB drive. For our purposes, we're installing on a virtual machine, so we'll require a special file called an ISO file that will allow us to install Windows Server 2012 as if we were using an installation disk. To get this file, we're going to obtain an evaluation copy of Windows Server 2012. To do that, we're going to head over to the Microsoft's TechNet Evaluation Center. You can reach this at microsoft.com slash en-us slash eval center. Click the Evaluate Now button and select Windows Server 2012 R2 or Release 2. In order to download our evaluation copy of Windows Server 2012, we need to have a Microsoft account. So I'll go ahead and sign in. And once I've signed in with my Microsoft account, I'll select the type of file I want to download. We need an ISO file. We will hit register and continue. and we'll fill in the information. Some of this information is not necessary. For instance, I can select other for my role in my company or organization. We're just using this as an evaluation. We do not need the system center components. And if you'd like to sign up for TechNet's communication emails, you can check the box for subscribe. We'll go ahead and click continue. And our download will begin. This is a larger file, about 4.2 gigabytes, so it may take a little while to download. Feel free to pause the video if you're following along, and we'll pick back up as soon as the download is finished. Now that our download has completed, I've gone ahead and moved the file to my desktop. Let's open back up VMware Workstation, and we'll click Create a New Virtual Machine. We're going to use the typical configuration and we'll select Installer Disk Image File. And we'll select our Windows Server ISO that we downloaded. We have the option of changing our virtual machine name and selecting a location for the files for the virtual machine. Now keep in mind that you'll need enough storage space to handle approximately 60 gigabytes, which is the default. Here we can change the maximum hard disk size. If you don't have enough space for the 60 gigabytes, you can turn this down, but it is recommended that you stay above 40 gigabytes. I'm going to leave it at the default. 
Before we start, we'll uncheck the Power On Virtual Machine after creation and click Finish. Now our virtual machine is set up and it's ready to install Windows Server. All right, we've set up our virtual machine and we've installed our ISO into the virtual CD drive of our virtual machine. And now we're ready to power on and install Windows Server 2012. So go ahead and select your VM that you made and click power on this virtual machine. You'll see on screen, just like you would in front of a physical machine, that the installer will begin, very similar to installing Windows or any other operating system. We'll select our language and keyboard, and then click Install Now. Now, there are several different versions of Windows Server. In fact, there are four. Foundation, Essentials, Standard, and Data Center. With this evaluation that we've downloaded, we have a choice between Standard and Data Center. For this tutorial, we're going to stick with the Standard Evaluation. Now, when you select the Operating System Edition, make sure you select the one that has the option Server with a GUI, or Graphical User Interface. You'll be presented with the license terms for Windows Server 2012. We'll accept those and click Next. We're not doing an upgrade, obviously, so we're going to install Windows only. And you'll see that we have one virtual hard drive available to us. We'll go ahead and click Next. Windows will begin copying Windows files, getting those files ready for installation, and finishing up the remainder of updating and setting up the system. This process may take 5 to 15 minutes depending on the speed of your computer. So we'll skip ahead to the end of the installation. Once the installation has finished, the computer will automatically restart. If you were installing this on a physical machine, it would also restart. Installation will continue after this reboot. Once the computer has restarted, you'll be prompted to set up the built-in administrator account. I'll type in a password and click Finish. Now that Windows has been successfully installed and I've set up my built-in administrator account, I'll press Control-Alt-Delete to sign in. In VMware Workstation, Control-Alt-Delete won't work, so you'll press Control-Alt-Insert. On a physical machine, you would press Control-Alt-Delete. I'll type in my password that I set up for my account, and I'll be signed in. The Server Manager window will open, giving me an overview of my server. From here, we've successfully installed Windows Server onto a virtual machine, and from here we can begin to set up our environment. Now that we have a working Windows Server 2012 installation, our next step is to create a Windows domain. Well, what is a Windows domain? A Windows domain is a computer network where user accounts, computers, and resources, and the security for all those things are stored and defined on one or more servers that are called domain controllers. Users and computers on the domain are authenticated through the domain controllers, and the permissions to the resources are based on user accounts and the groups that contain user accounts. So with that information in mind, it's time to set up our Windows Server as a domain controller and create our first domain. For the remainder of this course, I'm going to be using VMware Workstation in full screen mode. At the very top of the window, you can see the Enter Full Screen Mode button. To exit full screen mode, simply move your cursor to the top and click the Full Screen Mode button again. 
This will help us to be able to see what we're doing with inside the window. When we first start up Windows Server and log in, we should see the Server Manager utility. The Server Manager utility allows us to get an overview of the different roles and configurations that we've set up for our local server, as well as servers that we've added to any groups within the domain once we've created it. If you don't see the Server Manager window when you first log into Windows, you can access it through the Quick Launch toolbar or through the Start menu. There are some preliminary steps that we need to set up in order to make our domain controller active and working properly. We can go up to configure this local server to set some of these options. First, we need to give our server a name. In the top left hand corner, you can see that I've already set a name for my server. If I click the name, I can change it. It'll open the system properties menu. I can click change and from here I can change my server's name. Once I click OK and confirm my changes, I'll need to restart the server in order to save the change. We'll also want to make sure that Windows updates are turned on. The Windows update settings, when you click them, will show you what your current settings are. I've already turned mine on, and it's always a good idea to keep your server up to date with the latest patches. This prevents any vulnerabilities or any bugs from occurring that would impact user experience. We'll also want to make sure that our time zone and our time are set correctly. I prefer setting up an internet time server so that Windows can sync with an external source. There are some built-in options for time servers, which you can use, or you can use one of your own if you're familiar with the protocol. I also want to make sure that my time zone is set correctly. There are some other options on the left-hand side that we'll want to configure as well. The defaults for Windows Firewall, Remote Management, and Remote Desktop will be fine for now. NIC teaming is an option that allows you to combine different physical network interfaces to one IP address. We'll skip that for now since that's a more advanced feature. We do need to configure a static IP address for this server. Since it's going to be a domain controller, its IP address must not change. If it does, that could cause some problems in the future. So let's go ahead and configure a static IP address now. When we click our current configuration within Server Manager, we will be presented with a list of our current Ethernet adapters. This server only has one since that's what we configured as a typical configuration in VMware. If I right click this and click Status and then Details, It'll show you the current IP address and IP settings that have been given by the DHCP server built into VMware. We need to change this so that this information is static and will not change. So I'm going to make a quick note of my IP address, my gateway, as well as the DNS server. Now I'll go into Properties, open up IP Protocol version 4, and instead of obtain IP address automatically, I'll use the following IP address and enter that information I took from before. Once I've entered my settings, you can click OK. Now we've prepared our server with the basic settings that will allow it to become a domain controller. Let's go back to the dashboard on Server Manager and click Add Roles and Features to add the Active Directory Domain Services role. The Add Roles and Features wizard will appear and we can click Next. The Active Directory and Domain Services role is a role-based and feature-based installation, so that default setting is perfect. If we have multiple servers in our pool, which right now we only have one, we can select it and install roles to different servers, but we're going to install this one locally.
we'll select Active Directory Domain Services and then click Next. We should also install Group Policy Management as that will help us in some of the later lectures in this course. Then we'll click Install. Once the roles have been installed, we'll be prompt to perform any additional steps that are necessary in activating that role's features. In this example, we're setting up a domain controller, and we need to take advantage of the Active Directory domain services, so this server needs to be promoted to a domain controller. The Active Directory domain services configuration wizard will open. We'll first be prompted to select a deployment operation. You'll see three options. You can add a domain controller to an existing domain, add a new domain to an existing forest, or add a new forest. This is a new term forest. What is it? A forest is simply a group of domains. If you remember from the beginning of this lecture, a domain is a computer network where the domain controller houses all of the user, computer, and resource information in a local directory. A forest is simply a group of domains where there are separate groups of domain controllers and all of that information is controlled on an individual per domain basis but all belong to the same forest. We don't have a forest yet so we need to create a new one. We'll be prompted to enter a root domain name. Now when you hear the word domain name you may be thinking of something like google.com or yahoo.com in a Windows domain context, domain name doesn't refer to an internet domain name, but rather a record that all the computers and all of the user accounts use to look up resources within the domain. I could enter something like google.com as my root domain name. However, anytime somebody within the domain tried to access something with the domain name google.com, the computer would think that that is a resource within the domain. I can't use something that's on the internet because then my users would not be able to access that internet web address. Instead we should use a domain name that doesn't exist on the internet and isn't used anywhere else within our domain as a web resource or any other type of resource. A good practice to use is always using something that does not exist on the internet and the best practice is to use something that ends in .local because .local addresses cannot exist on a public domain namespace. So I'm going to use the domain name test.local. Next we'll set our forest and domain functional levels. The functional level of a forest or a domain is simply a set of features that is allowed on that domain as a whole. This is mainly controlled by what versions of Windows Server are active domain controllers within your domain. For example, if all of my servers within the domain were Windows Server 2012 R2, then I could easily set my forest and domain functional level to Windows Server 2012 R2. There are additional considerations to make if you're using older versions of Windows Server. Your forest or domain functional level may need to be set lower. Since this is the only domain controller in our domain, the default works just fine. We're also asked to specify this domain controller's capabilities. We want this domain controller to be a DNS server. We'll describe more about DNS servers later, but basically it's simply a record of all the computers and devices within the domain network and their IP addresses that are associated with them. A global catalog is simply a record of all of the resources that exist on the domain controller and are advertised to all the users and computers based on their permissions. The primary domain controller that we're setting up now has to be a global catalog because it's the first domain controller. You'll also see that the read-only domain controller is grayed out and you cannot enable it. This is because the first primary domain controller is being set up and needs to be writable. Later, you could set up a domain controller that is read-only for special purposes. Lastly, we need to set up a do directory services restore mode password. DSRM is a tool that's used to recover directory services and directory information in case of a disaster. So we'll set up a password for that now. Make sure you note this down 
in case you ever need it in the future. When you first set up a primary domain controller in a basic domain, you'll be warned that delegation for the DNS server cannot be created because of an authoritative parent zone not being able to be found. This is normal and it can be ignored. Next, we'll be asked to set the NetBIOS domain name. NetBIOS is simply the first part of the root domain name that we set. We want this to be the same, so the default is perfect. Next, we'll be asked to specify the location of the ADDS database, or the Active Directory Domain Services database, the log files, and the sysvol folder. The defaults for these folders are fine, but in more advanced lessons, you can learn to modify the locations of these to suit your purposes. We'll leave them by default for now. We're then given an option to review all of our selections and to make sure that everything looks correct. When we click Next, Windows Server will begin checking to make sure that all of the prerequisites for becoming a domain controller are met. It will give you warnings in case anything needs to be brought attention. The first item is a warning about security. There is a setting in Windows 2012 domain controllers, by default, that is turned on that allows compatibility in cryptography with older Windows Server systems. This is a potential security risk because older cryptography algorithms are sometimes weaker and subject to vulnerability. We'll ignore this for now, but it is a good thing to read up on the different vulnerabilities that might exist when you're warned about them. We'll also see that the warning we got earlier about DNS server is showing up as well. As before, this warning can be ignored. We'll see that all of our prerequisite checks have been completed and they have all passed successfully. We're ready to upgrade this server and promote it to a domain controller. Once the server has successfully installed Active Directory Domain Services and upgraded to a domain controller, we'll be warned that we're about to be signed out and the computer will restart. Once our server has restarted, it is now a primary domain controller on the test domain. We can now log in as our administrator account. And the server manager window will open. From here, we can configure our domain services and add other roles and features onto our domain controller. At the very bottom of your server manager, you'll see that ADDS has been installed, as well as DNS and file and storage services. In the next few lectures, you'll learn how to configure these services as well as add others. So now that our server is now a domain controller and we've installed Active Directory domain services, we now have to configure Active Directory. Well, what is Active Directory? It is the foundation of the Windows domain. It's essentially a catalog of all the registered objects in the domain, and it provides authentication services and security principles that allow those users and computers to access the resources that they've been granted permissions to. So we're going to start with a real world scenario. We're going to provide some realistic examples of how Active Directory might be set up. And we're going to go through and actually configure it as if we were starting fresh for a real business. So we're going to be working with the imaginary CarMax dealership. It has one headquarter location and two sales locations. The headquarters has an administrative department, accounting, and HR, and then the two locations have sales staff, mechanic staff, and management. So we're going to go into Active Directory, set up these different objects, and go from there. So back in our server with the server manager window open, we'll go up into the top right hand corner to Tools. Then we'll click Active Directory Users and Computers to open that snap-in. On the left-hand side of ADUC, or Active Directory Users and Computers, you'll see our test.local domain. If we expand that, we'll see some of the built-in OUs, or organizational units, that come by default. Now, when we're structuring Active Directory, my rule of thumb is always to start with the biggest organizational unit I can think of, and then work my way smaller. So with our example business, we want to start with the biggest division or biggest organizational structure unit that we can think of and then work smaller. So for our business, 
we'll start with our three locations. We've got a headquarters and two sales locations. So with our domain selected, we'll right click in the middle of the screen, then click New, Organizational Unit. And we'll give it a name. For instance, Headquarters. And we'll repeat that step for the other two locations. Now before I click New, I have the Headquarters OU selected. So right now I'm creating new objects within this OU. If I want to create an OU inside the root domain, I'll have to click that first. So I'll create two more organizational units, and we'll call our two sales locations CarMax East and CarMax West. From here, following our rule, we'll go to the next largest group of objects that we're going to put into Active Directory. Personally, I like to take each OU and separate them into users and computers, since that's going to be the most common object in our Active Directory structure. So for each location, I'm going to select it and create a new OU for computers. Make sure you name each one individually, so when you're looking at it on an individual basis, you know which one it is. So with this structure, I can put my users into headquarters and the computers at headquarters into the computers-headquarters OU. I'll repeat this for the next two organizational units. So now I have three OUs, our headquarters location, and our two sales locations, and a sub OU for each one for the computers at that location. I'll put the users and the user groups in each location. So starting with headquarters, we want to create our next smallest item. Now here's where we can set up our departments for each location. Now when we're talking about departments, or small groups of users like that, we need to consider what kind of things those people are going to need to access. When we're talking about security principles like that, whether it's accessing a file share or access to a printer, we want to base that on a user basis and a group basis. Commonly in businesses, accounting and administrative people have access to different sets of resources. So in our headquarters location, we're going to set up a user group for each of our departments. In our headquarters group selected, we'll right click and then create a new group. Oops. New group. We'll give the group a name. We'll make sure that the security group type is enabled, and we'll make sure that it is a global group. Then click OK. We'll repeat this step for the other two departments that we have at our headquarters location. Accounting. And HR. So now our headquarters location has a place for computers, a place for users, and separate groups of users that correspond to the different departments at that location. Now we also need to create our departments for our sales locations. Now keep in mind, within a domain you can't have two groups with the same name, even if they're in different organizational units. So it's best practice, like with our computers group that we have, or the computers OU under each location, to also append an individual or unique name to a group, if it's specific to this OU. So we'll do sales at CM East. Make sure that it's a security group and a global group. And we'll repeat that for the other two.
So now I have three user groups at that sales location, and since none of them have just the management mechanics or sales name, I can create the other three groups with CM West so there's no conflicts. So now we have our basic Active Directory structure created. The only thing that we're missing is some users. So we'll put in some dummy users, and you can use whatever usernames that you'd like or whatever names you'd like, as long as you remember to create one user that you'll want to use when you log in under an Active Directory account. So in headquarters, I'm going to create one user, new user, give him a name, and create a username or a user logon name. It's best to always have a naming convention for both computers, users, and as we've created, OUs and groups. I like to use first initial, last name, but you can use whatever you want. We'll set a password for our user. And since we have the user must change password at next logon, when this user first logs on with the password that you set, they'll be prompted to create a new one. Now our John Jones user that we've created is a member of the administrative department, so we need to add him to that group. We'll right click, select Add to Group, and the Select Groups window will open. Whenever we see this window, all we're doing is we're selecting the name of the object that we want to add to. We selected John Jones and we clicked Add to Group. So right now we're looking for groups within the test.local domain that we want to add John Jones or whichever users we've selected to. So we're going to enter Administrative and we're going to click Check Names. Looks like it found the group because it underlined it and we'll click OK. The Add to Group operation is completed, and if we open our administrative group by right-clicking and hitting Properties, we can go to Members to see that John Jones has been added. The purpose of groups, of course, is to give permissions to a group of users without having to go into each individual user and modifying their permissions. If I gave the administrative group access to a resource, John Jones gets access because he is a member of administrative. Now let's practice adding one more user to a group, but this time let's do it at one of the sales locations. So remember we're putting our users in the root OU of the location. We'll right click, go to new, and then select new user. We'll give the user a name, and following our naming convention, we'll give him a username. We'll set a password, and click Next. Now we'll add Mike Jones to the mechanics group of CM East. So we'll right click Mike Jones, add to group, and this time we'll just search mechanics. Click check names, and you'll see that there are multiple matches. Because remember we have a mechanics group at CM East and CM West. Well, Mike is a mechanic at CM East, so we'll select the CM East mechanics group. We'll select OK the operation completed, and we can go into Mechanics to check to make sure that he is properly added. There's another way to add users to a group, and that's by going through the group itself. Let's say Mike Jones is also a member of the Sales Department. So we'll right-click the Sales Department, click Properties, click Members, and then click Add. This window looks familiar. Instead of searching for groups, we're searching for users in the test.local domain. 
Which user do we want to add? We want to add Mike Jones. Now we can search by his name or his username. I know his name, so we'll type in Mike, check names, and it looks like it found our Mike Jones. We'll click OK, and then we'll click Apply. That's the other way of adding a user to a group. Next we'll go over moving, disabling, and deleting Active Directory users and other objects. So let's work with our Mike Jones user. Let's say that Mike Jones got moved to headquarters because he got promoted. We're going to move him by right-clicking his user account, clicking Move, and then selecting the container that we want to move him to. We're going to move him to the headquarters OU. So you'll see that Mike's account is gone from the CM East OU and has been moved to the headquarters OU. Now when we move user accounts or groups, they still retain their group membership. So if we go into Mike Jones's account, even though we've moved him to a new OU, he is still a member of Mechanics and Sales at CM East. So we need to remove him from these groups now that he is at the headquarters OU. We're going to select CM East, and we can hold down the Shift or Control key to select the two groups. We can select Remove and click Yes to remove him from those groups. With user accounts, we also have the ability to disable them. This has multiple uses in the real world, but for example, let's say Mike goes on an extended vacation. We need to disable his account for security reasons while he's away. We can right-click his account, then click Disable, and it will confirm that we've disabled the account. On the left-hand side, we can see that his account has a downward-facing arrow indicating that his account has been disabled. When an account is disabled, that user will not be able to access any resources, and if they're connected to the domain network, they will not be able to log in. We can enable Mike's account by right-clicking, then clicking Enable where the Disable button used to be. When you need to delete a user or a group or any other Active Directory object, you can simply right-click the object, then click Delete. It will confirm your selection, and the object will be deleted. Lastly, we'll go over several more options we have with modifying users and several of the actions that we can take with their accounts. If we look at our John Jones user, we can right-click and we get some several options we haven't gone over yet. For instance, we can copy, which copies John Jones's account and all of its settings into a new account, allowing you to rename that new account and model a new user after John Jones. We can reset John's password, enabling him to change it again after he logs on the next time. If we go into the Properties page of a user, we have several tabs where we can edit the user's information, like Address, Account Settings, Profile Options, as well as a variety of other settings. The most commonly used tab in the User Account Properties page is the Account tab. Here we can change the user's username or user logon name. We can unlock or lock the account, and we can make some changes to the account options. We can also set an expiration on the user account if it's a temporary account. Here we can also set logon hours when the user is permitted to log on. In the next lecture, we'll be going over DNS. I hope to see you there. In this lecture, we're going to be going over group policy. Group policy is a tool that allows you to create and deploy policies and settings for the users and computers within your domain. Now, I'm not going to be able to cover the entirety of group policy and all that you can do with it in this lecture. And the reason for that is because there are literally thousands of potential policies that you could push out. Instead, what we'll do is we'll use some common examples and ones that would fit within the context of our imaginary business that we're setting up. 
So first we need to make sure that group policy management is installed. And if you remember back when we installed AD domain services, we checked the box for group policy management so that we wouldn't have to do it around here at this time. But we can still make sure it's installed if we go to add roles and features within the server manager. And group policy is a feature. So we'll skip ahead down to the features section and we'll see the group policy management is already installed. And if it wasn't, we could go ahead and check the box, hit next and install that. And to open group policy management, we'll go to the top right hand corner to tools and we'll click group policy management. And the snap in will open. In the top left hand corner, you'll see our forest test.local and then you'll see domains and then you'll see our domain that we've created test.local. Now when we talk about group policy in terms of structure, we need to realize that everything that you do in group policy is OU based, a lot like Active Directory. So you'll see our Active Directory OUs on the left hand side, CM East, West, Domain Controllers, Headquarters. And the first thing that we need to talk about when we're creating policies that we're going to apply is that when we create a policy, we're not only working within the context of which users or computers am I going to apply this policy to, we also need to pay attention as to where we are linking those policies as to the OUs that they're placed in. When we create a policy, let's say we create a policy in the headquarters OU. Regardless of what users or computers that we apply the policy to, they must be within the headquarters OU in Active Directory in order for that policy to apply. If I created a policy in headquarters and applied it to a user that was in CM West, that policy would not apply. I have to make sure that when I create a policy in the headquarters OU or any other OU, I'm applying that to users and computers that I want to be applied that are in the headquarters OU. So pay attention to the structure when you're setting up domain or uh, group policies and always keep in mind that when you place it in an OU, you're only applying that to the users and computers that you set that exist within that OU. So in the top, you'll see a default domain group policy object. This one comes built in when you install group policy management. And if we go into the settings, we can see some of the settings that uh, exist within this particular policy. By default, it sets a password policy, an account lockout policy, a Kerberos policy, security, encrypting file systems. We're not gonna grow, go over every single one of these, but the most common that we're gonna set up is these top two, the password policy and the account lockout policy. The password policy, that is simply um, a policy that applies to the characteristics of a user's password. When do they need to reset their password? Does the password need to be a certain length or have a certain amount of complexity? How many, how many passwords can they reuse or can they reuse any? So th that's a policy that we would set up for the entire domain in most cases. Uh, we also want to set an account lockout policy. Basically, when a person enters an incorrect password a certain number of times, they'll get locked out of their account. That is where we set that setting. So with this default domain policy, we're going to go ahead and edit this. Now, since this policy is not in an OU, it's right underneath the domain. This is what we would call a global or a global domain policy. It applies to all the OUs. If you place a group policy object within an OU, it only applies to that OU. But if we have a policy like the default one that's placed outside of all the OUs, it will apply to the entire domain. So we'll right click this and hit edit. And then the group policy management editor will open. This is, this is where we can edit this particular group policy object. And you can see its name right here at the top. So if you ever don't know which, or if you ever forget which one you're working with, that will be the name of the policy you're working with. Now, if we step back for a moment and we look at the settings for this group policy object, you'll see that there are two sections. One is the computer configuration and one is the user configuration. And we can see that also in the group policy management editor for this particular group policy object. You'll see a section for computer and user. And the difference between the two is that there are certain policies that apply to users, certain policies that apply to computers. 
And as you get more familiar with group policy, you'll you'll start to remember where things are located. Certain policies would only apply to that user account or certain policies would apply to the whole computer. And there are even some policies that you could apply to either uh, because of the way that that policy gets applied. Now, we're not going to go into depth as to which policies are where because that's something that would take a little while to go over. And again, there are many, many policies that we could we could cover. But for right now, we're primarily going to be covering computer policies. Uh, the reason for that is because they affect every user that logs onto that computer and we're mainly setting up security policies uh, for the users that log in. So if we just follow this, the uh, hierarchy that it's got listed in here, we can go into policies under computer configuration, windows settings, and then security settings. And it looks like we're going under account policies, password policies. So there's account policy, password policy. So there it is. This is where we can change the settings that are in here and you can see what's currently set. So let's go over just some of the basics. Now when we're editing a group policy here, these are a policy and a policy setting. If I double click this, I can change the setting. Now in most built-in group policy options that you have the ability to change, you can, if you don't know what it does, you can always click this explain tab and it will tell you in detail what, what this setting will do, what options you have to change, and what will happen when you change that, either if it's a true or false, or if it's a number that you need to set, what will changing that do? So always read over the explanation if you don't know what you're changing or what you're doing. This will always give you some good insight as to what we're doing. But with the secure policy setting, this is a enforced password history. So when a user changes their password, they can't use that old password again until a certain amount of password changes. So let's set this to something like 12. So a, a user will need to change their password 12 times before they can reuse an old password. And you can set this as low or as high as you want to, or you can set it to zero to turn it completely off. So we're gonna hit, uh, set it as 12 and hit apply. And the maximum password age, and if we hit explain, this will tell us what that does. And basically what this setting is, is how old can the password be before the user needs to change it? So after 42 days, the user will need to change their password. When they go and log in, they will be forced to change it. Now they can, they will also get a warning that, hey, your, your password is coming up for expiration. Do you want to change it now? And that counter will reset. So let's change that to something like three weeks. Let's set that for 21 days. A lot of businesses do this uh, about a month. I'll do it for three weeks, just in this example. And the minimum password age, that is uh, usually not, uh, doesn't need to be set. Um, that can be used in specific use cases. We'll leave that as one day. Minimum password length, that's pretty self-explanatory. How long does their password need to be? It doesn't matter uh, if it's letters or numbers, that it's not talking about that. It's just talking about how many characters long is it. We'll leave it at seven, that's good. Password must meet complexity requirements. Now, by default, Windows Domain doesn't really allow you to say, I need this many numbers, this many character, or this many uh, uh, special characters, that sort of thing. They just have an on or off. Does the password need to be complex or can it be simple? And what they mean by complex is it needs to have these particular requirements. So it needs to be six characters in length, contain characters from three of the four, these four categories got to have uppercase, lowercase numbers and special characters. So it is a good idea to leave this enabled that greatly enhances the security in your network. You definitely don't want somebody being able to guess or brute force their way in. So we'll leave that on. Uh, the last option is whether or not this, uh, the passwords for users are stored on the domain controller using a method of encryption that's reversible. And what that means is when a password is set on a user, that is stored in such a way that the uh, password cannot be decrypted very easily. And so we want to keep that disabled. We want to make sure that our passwords aren't easy to get to. So that's it for the password policy. Let's go to the next one, uh, account lockout policy. That's just below that. 
So account lockout duration. Now what this is, is how long is the user locked out if they get their password incorrect so many times? So we're going to define this. If we check the box, and now normally it's undefined, and what that means is that the policy is simply turned off. So we'll go ahead and define this policy, and let's say we'll lock them out for 30 minutes. That sounds fine. Now it's going to give us a warning. These other two need to be enabled and configured in order for that policy we just changed to be changed successfully. So it's going to put some defaults in there. We'll go ahead and change those after the fact. So we'll apply that, hit OK. Account lockout threshold. How many times does the user enter their password incorrectly before it locks them out? Five, that sounds just fine. And reset account lockout after how many minutes? So they'll get locked out for 30 minutes. And after that 30 minutes is up, the account will be re-unlocked, so to speak. We'll leave that enabled. That's fine. So that's it for our two most common policies. And we're applying this again to a computer configuration. And since it's directly underneath our domain, it's not in any OUs, it's going to get applied to all of the computers within that domain. But we need to make sure first that our scope is applied correctly. So we're going to close this. And next, we're going to click the Scope tab. Now, in our default domain policy, you'll see that it's applying to this domain, test.local. And it's filtered to these objects. And the object that it's filtering to is authenticated users. Now, it may be confusing. We've got a, a policy that's being applied to the entire domain. But there's only computer policies in it, yet we're filtering it down to authenticated users. It really doesn't matter if you're applying a policy to users or computers. You generally want to only apply it to user objects when you're talking about security filtering. So the fact that this says authenticated users, that's perfect. We want that to always be the users that we want to apply that policy to, because when that user logs in, that computer policy will apply to that comp particular computer as long as it is a computer within the domain, since we've applied this policy here. So what I'd like to do next is create a policy for the financial folks that work at the headquarters at, at our imaginary car dealership. Now, the financial people are probably working on important accounting stuff, and they probably have some sensitive information on their computers. And we want to make sure that their computers lock if they get up and walk away for a certain amount of time. That's so that nobody can just walk up and start messing around and look at things that they shouldn't see. So we're going to create a policy in the headquarters OU. We'll go ahead and click that, and then right-click, and click Create a GPO in this domain, and link it here. We're going to name this GPO, so we're going to say Screen Timeout. And now you'll see that that GPO is applied. If we expand headquarters, we'll see that that's been applied. And by default, it automatically puts our authenticated users, and that's fine. So we're going to go ahead and edit this policy and right click it, click Edit. So we're going to set up an inactivity lock. After the machine is inactive for so much time, the computer will automatically lock. This policy is located under Computer Configuration, Policies, Windows Settings, Security Settings, Local Policies, and then Security Options. So the policy we're looking for is under Interactive Logon, and it's called Machine Inactivity Limit. We're going to double click that. We're going to check the box to define the setting. And we'll set that to something like five minutes. Look, notice that it's asking for it in seconds. Again, we can always click Explain if we want to get a definition of that policy. So now once we click Apply and click OK, you'll see that the policy has been defined. It's been set at 300 seconds. And if we exit the group policy editor and then click settings for this group policy, we'll see that the interactive logon policy has been set to 300 seconds. So now when a computer is within the headquarters OU and a user logs on to it, once that computer has been inactive for 300 seconds or five minutes, that computer will automatically go to the screensaver and then lock. So when that user comes back, they'll need to sign back in in order to unlock the computer.
Now we need to make sure that this policy is applying to the particular users we want it to apply to. Right now we've got this group policy object or GPO in the headquarters OU. So we know that it's only going to apply with, to things that are in that headquarters OU. So we know that we've got the location right. But now we're going to go to scope and we'll see that security filtering is set to authenticated users. And what that means is users that have been authenticated and logged onto the computer in the domain network. But we don't want to just apply this to authenticated users to all of them. We want to apply it to only the financial folks. So if we go back into Active Directory, and again, we can go to Server Manager, Tools, Active Directory, Users and Computers. And if we go to the headquarters, we'll see that we set up a accounting group. Now, when we're creating this group policy, when we're setting up filtering, we can apply it to groups, users, and computers. So perfect, we have a group that applies to this particular GPO that we want to push this GPO out to. So we'll click Remove on Authenticated Users, and we'll click Add, and then we'll type our accounting group. We'll see it underlined, so it found it, hit OK. And so now we've got that group set up. This GPO will apply to users that are in the accounting group as long as those members are in the headquarters OU. So we've successfully set up our GPO. It's going to apply to our users that we want to apply it to. So that's the basics of setting up a group policy object. And again, when we're setting up group policy, Keep in mind that there are literally thousands of policies that we could set up for computers, for users. We can set up scripts that run when the user starts the computer or logs on or logs off. There are many, many options in terms of setting up the computers in your network the way that you want through group policy. A really good resource to use is TechNext's website. And I've included a link within the lecture resources that will take you to basically a list of all of the group policies and what they do. Of course, you can always use that, uh, that tool within group policy to get an explanation, but TechNet is a really good resource to look at some of the more common group policy objects and what's common practice in terms of keeping your domain secure, as well as the workstations and user accounts within your domain. Next, we're going to go over file sharing and permissions, and from there, we'll move on to print services. Next, we're going to quickly go over print services, which allows you to share network printers with users and deploy them in a way where they don't need to uh, add a printer individually onto their computer. The basics of it is that you set up a printer within your network and you set up Windows Server to be a print server. And that provides the drivers and the print queue on the server to be available for users to use. So first we need to install that role. So we go back to Add Roles and Features. And this is a role installation. So we'll go to Server Roles. And we'll select Print and Document Services. We'll check that. It lets us know that it's also going to install the administration tools for that role. So we'll click Add Features. It gives us a little overview of Print and Document Services and what that does. And there's also some, some other features that come along with that. Um, we can do a distributed scan. Uh, we can do internet printing, LPD. Right now, we're just going to do a basic print server. We'll go ahead and click Install. And the installation will start. Once the installation is finished, we can click Close. And you'll see that the print services role has been installed. So now to access the tool for print management, we can go up to Tools and scroll down to Print Management. In Print Management, in the Snap-in, we'll see that we have some filters available to view what we have installed. So under All Printers, we'll see that we have the built-in XPS Document Writer. And under Drivers, we'll see that we have some drivers available to use. So what we need to do is we need to install a network printer and then we're going to check to make sure that, that a printer is available to use on the network for users. So what we'll do is we'll go to Print Servers. 
We only have the one, so we'll expand our server. And then we'll go down to printers. Now this is a similar view to what we did above, but within this menu we can right click and select add printer. Now if you've ever installed a network printer on Windows or Windows 7, 8, 10, it's fairly simple. What we can do is do it by IP address since I have a static IP address set up on my printer. But you can also search for the network printer, use an existing port if it's a attached printer directly to the server, or we could manually create a new port. We're going to do that by the IP address since I have a static IP on my printer. So we'll type in the IP address of our printer. It's going to contact the printer and try to grab the most relevant drivers for that printer. Looks like it found the printer. And we're going to make sure that we turn on sharing. Now what that does is it makes that printer available on the network for other people to use. We'll give it a friendly name. And we probably want to fill in the location. Let's say that this printer is at the headquarters. And it's at the front office. We can also add a comment that users will see if they open up the properties tab of that printer. So we'll select next. It'll give us a summary of our settings. And it will begin to install the printer. Once the printer installation is succeeded, we could actually go ahead and try to print a test page just to make sure that the server's connection to the printer is working. Or we can add another printer if we have multiples that we need to add. But we'll go ahead and click Finish. And we'll see that in the queue, this printer is ready to print. Now there are multiple options in deploying this printer in a way that the users can access it. We could list it in the directory, in Active Directory, so that when a user goes to install a printer, they can look it up and install it themselves. Or we could deploy that printer with group policy. It's going to be different in every case. If you have a printer that everybody in the company uses or everybody in the building uses, it might be appropriate to use group policy so that all the people in the business have access to that printer already installed, ready for them, even new users that might not be familiar with installing a printer. If your users are fairly familiar with installing printers over the network, or you can teach them how to do that, it's a lot simpler to list it in the directory. So we're going to do both so that we get a good handle on how to do each type of deployment. So listing in the directory is quite simple. All we do is right click the printer and select list in directory. Now that printer is listed in the directory and if a user wanted to install it, they would simply open up devices and printers on their PC, select add a printer, and that printer would be listed. If they can't find it or if it's not showing up, we can select find a printer in the directory and we'll see that our printer is listed along with the location and the model. Now if we want to deploy a printer over group policy, it's a little more complicated. We'll right click our printer and select deploy with group policy. Now in order for us to be able to deploy a printer over group policy, we need to have a group policy object in place for that policy to reside. Now I could go ahead and manually configure that. I could go into group policy and set up the policy and deploy the printer by manually selecting all of those things. But this wizard within print management allows me to create a group policy automatically without having to do it all manually. So what we'll do is we'll click browse. And if I already had a policy that I wanted to add this printer to, I could just go ahead and select it and the wizard would, would take care of adding those settings. But I don't have a policy for printing yet. So I'm going to create one. I'm going to create one within the headquarters OU. And it might be practical to do it for each OU because there might be different printers at each location. So I'll double click the headquarters OU. And now within that, I'm going to create a new group policy object. And I'm simply going to name that printers. So with the printers policy that we just created, we'll click OK. And we'll deploy this printer connection to the following, either per user or per machine. Do we want this printer to be available for all of the users within the headquarters, or do we want it to be available for all of the computers? Well, it really doesn't matter because more than likely, all of the computers that are in the headquarters OU are going to be used by users within that OU. 
you can customize that. If you have a user coming from a different OU using a computer at a different location, you might want to make it per machine. That way, when they use a computer at that OU, they automatically have the printer in that OU based on this group policy. So we can configure that uh, independently if we want to. I'm going to do it per user because I want the, this printer to be available only to the people who normally work within headquarters. But I could also do per machine if I wanted. So once I have that selected, I'll click Add. And now I have the printer name, the GPO that it's going to apply to, and it's going to go per user. I'll go ahead and click OK. Printer deployment or removal operation succeeded, and I can see the details on that if I need to. And just to make sure that I've deployed it OK, I can go back into Server Manager and open up Group Policy Management under Tools. And I can go into the Headquarters and select Printers. And if I go under Settings, I can see my printer connection there. So when that user logs in, if they belong to the HQ uh, OU, they're going to automatically get that printer connection. One thing to consider when you're setting up a print server is that when users go to install a printer that they don't have drivers for, the server will try to advertise drivers to that computer and the user will have the choice to accept the drivers that the server is presenting to their computer. The one thing that we have to keep in mind is in order to install drivers that user must be an administrator. So there are two options of dealing with that issue. You can either simply have the user get in touch with a, with a network administrator and have them enter their credentials to install the drivers. And there's also a policy in group policy that allows users to install printers on their own without administrative credentials. That's a little advanced in terms of setting that up, but you want to keep in mind that the user will need to have the rights to install drivers on their machine in order to start printing. That's it for print management. Next, we're going to go over file sharing over a Windows domain network. This last lecture will be on file and storage services. This allows you to share files on the network so that users can access them, modify them, and share them amongst each other. We need to make sure that the file and services role is installed. And you can see that it's installed. And if we didn't have it installed, we could go to Add Roles and Features, and then go to Server Roles. We would check the box for file and storage services and then install it. In order to give access to files on the server to users in our domain, we need to create a share. To do that, we won't go through tools because there is no snap-in directly related to file and storage services. Instead, we can directly click on the role, and on the left side we'll see some options that we can use to create file and storage services for our users. On the left hand side you'll see that we have disks as well as volumes and these are places in which we can create files to share with users. We'll also see shares on the left hand side and this is where we will create shares of files and folders for our users. You'll see three built-in shares and these shares are built in into Windows domain and they shouldn't be modified. Instead we can right click and select new share to open the new share wizard. There are several profiles available to create shares on the Windows Server, and you'll see that there's basically two types. There's NFS shares and SMB shares. SMB shares, or server message block shares, are standard Windows shares. NFS is meant for Linux, Unix, or Mac OS operating systems. Since we have Windows users in our domain, we're going to do an SMB share, and we're going to use the quick profile. We'll select the server where we want to create the share, as well as select the volume where we want the share to be created. If we had more than one hard drive or more than one volume on a hard drive, we would be able to select that and change the location where the share is located. We'll be prompted to give the share a name, and in this case, I'm going to create a public share that all the users will have the ability to access. We can enter a share description that users will see if they hover over that share or access the properties page. And then we can select the local path. This is where the actual files will be stored on the server. We can change this path if we want, but we'll leave it as default for now. 
The remote path to share is the path that the users will enter in order to access this share. The default will work fine. In other settings, we have some more advanced settings we can configure. Access-based enumeration is probably the most important. Access-based enumeration disallows a user from seeing files or folders that they do not have access to. Most administrators typically leave this setting turned off, and the reason for that is because if a user can't see a file or folder, they may think that it doesn't exist. In most cases, it's better to let users see a file and be prompted that they don't have access to it so that they can contact an administrator to have that resolved. So we'll leave that setting turned off for now. And the other two settings here we can cover in more advanced courses. Next, we'll specify the permissions to control access. And we'll see that we have some built-in permissions already configured. The creator and owner of the file has full control, and that's me. The users have special and read and execute privileges. The administrators have full control. And the built-in system account also has full control. We're setting up a share that everyone will have full control on the share. By default, this is already set up, so we'll leave this as default. We'll then get a page that shows our selections so that we can confirm our settings, and then we'll click Create. We'll see that the share was successfully created, and in the server manager, we'll see that our share is listed. To test this, we can open up a file browser, navigate using double backslash our server name, and then the share name. We have access to the public share, and in here, since I have permissions as an administrator, I can add files, delete them, read them, and change permissions on those folders since I have permissions to do so. We're going to create one more share, and this one will be restricted to certain users. So we'll right click and select New Share. Once again, we'll use the Quick Profile. We'll use our standard server and volume. And we're going to create a share for the accounting users. The default local path and remote path are fine. We'll leave the other settings as default. Now we need to make it so that only the accounting users can have access to this particular share. In order to do that, we have to take several steps to change the default share permissions in the new share wizard. So we'll go to Customize Permissions. And in here, we'll notice that we have an option to disable inheritance. Basically what this means is that these permissions are being inherited from their parent folder. In order to set explicit permissions and give only particular groups access, we need to turn off this inheritance and create explicit permissions. So we'll click Disable Inheritance, and we'll convert the inherited permissions into explicit permissions. We're going to remove our users' permissions, and we're going to add permissions for the accounting group. We'll select a principle of accounting. The type is allow, and we'll apply it to this folder and all of the subfolders and files in the share. We're going to give our accounting group full control and select OK. Now we can see that our permissions have been changed so that only accounting and administrators have access to the share. We'll click OK, click Next, and then click Create. We'll see that our share has been successfully created, and it's now in the share list. To test it, we can open up our server name again with a double backslash, and open the accounting share. Now if we go back to our server, right-click the accounting share, and click Properties, in the Security tab we'll see that the accounting group has access as well as administrators, and no other user groups are listed. So that's the basics of setting up a share on Windows Server and configuring permissions so that users can access them.
So we've reached the end of the course on Windows Server 2012 administration for beginners. I'd like to thank you for participating and I would love to hear your feedback on the course. If you look in the top left hand corner of your screen, you'll see some resources that are going to be really beneficial to you as you're getting familiar with some of the things we went over. And just to recap, we've set up a Windows server from scratch. We've created a domain and set up some of the basic domain services. And in the future courses that I'll be putting out, we'll be getting into some of the more intermediate and advanced setups that you can do within a Windows domain. And so I look forward to seeing you there. Once again, please leave me feedback. I'd love to hear back from you, whether positive or negative. And take care and have a great day.